What's itching my rashes? I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards. Nobody liked that intro. <laughs> Sophie is giving me the cut signal. Uh, everyone else just looks ashamed uh, and hard. Cody's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, I'm politely oh. smiling. Katie's <laughs> politely smiling. I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards podcast. Talk about bad people, the worst people, all of them in history. What you don't know about them. My guest today, Cody Johnston, Katie Stoll. Hello. Hello. Hi. How, how are you Hi. guys doing? Great. Really, really well. I'm doing fantastic. What did you guys think of my of my intro? I thought it was good. I'll, good? I'll, <laughs> I'll reiterate. The thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that scans well for a podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it again. Movements. Physical comedy mm-hmm. is great for podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was fine with your intro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you. It's no, it's no what's cracking my peppers, but they can't all sure. be. Sure. They no. can't all be. You just, mm-hmm. you got to try stuff out. You got to try stuff out. That's the only way uh, you know it works. And it's mm-hmm. also a great way to get rashes. Speaking of rashes. <laughs> true. While we're on the subject. Speaking of a rash on our collective nation, uh, uh. our subject for today <laughs> is a fella named George Lincoln Rockwell. Have either of you all heard of George Lincoln Rockwell? Minimal. Um, yeah, I'm not that familiar. I would say, based off the three names, he mm. killed people. Not directly. Mm. Oh. But those are always the people who wind up killing the most people. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the indirect it's, ones. How does yeah. that song go? People who don't directly kill people <laughs> are the <laughs> killingest yeah, people yeah. in the world. Yeah, he's got blood on his hands. Well, yes. Absolutely. So, near the end of February 2019, if you remember that far back, uh, federal Years authorities ago. arrested U.S. Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan with a cache of guns and a list of liberal and leftist politicians and journalists he wanted to murder. On April 1995, Tim McVeigh detonated an enormous fertilizer bomb outside the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. Last October, Robert Bowers walked into the Tree of Life synagogue and murdered 11 people. Between 1995 and 2019, we've seen a couple of hundred far-right terror attacks and attempted terror attacks and murders. Uh, Behind each of these attacks and each of these deaths is an individual terrorist with his or her own journey to radicalization. But there is one single man who shows up in the ideological chain of custody for every single act of right-wing terror in our lifetimes. And that man is George Lincoln Rockwell. There it is. There I'm we go. I'm so excited. Uh, Excellent intro. In the worst way possible. <laughs> Y'all were, when, when I knew I was doing GLR, what we call it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, us, of us, us, in us, us, us GLR heads. <laughs> call us, them us GLR, GLR heads. <laughs> I knew y'all were the only possible guest for this. Uh, Appreciate that. Because oh, that's so touching. Yeah. You, you also <laughs> produced regular terrified content mm-hmm. about the, the horrifying things happening in our country. And you can say it's our niche. Mm-hmm. This guy makes a lot of that make more sense because he's where most of it starts. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, this week's three-part episode is the longest podcast I've ever written uh, by a couple of thousand words. It started initially as a five-part special episode. I wanted to go into detail about all the bastards behind our current wave of right-wing terrorism. There's a fascinating, terrifying intellectual history there, and I think it's very important for people to know. Rockwell was just going to be one part of that series, but then I wrote 13,000 words on him. (laughs) So here we are. Uh, I am still going to put together a five-part audiobook uh, on all the bastards who invented right-wing terror. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of this episode. But Rockwell is special. Uh, He's the grandfather of all modern American fascists. Uh, He started uh, the sort of fight that we're all in right now, if you consider yourself (sighs) in that fight. It's a bad fight. fight. It's it's a terrible (laughs) fight. Nobody likes it. And it's a ridiculous fight. Uh, So, let's get into it. Rockwell was born on March 9th, 1918, in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, So, like me, he's an Illinois baby. Mm. Aw. Yeah. I see the similarities and the connections already. Yeah. Yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, (laughs) he just wait. Now, he was the oldest of three children. George's parents were both vaudeville performers. Uh, His dad was somewhat famous for pretending to be a doctor in a bit that does not translate down through the decades, because I can't, I've read a couple descriptions of it, and I can't understand what the joke was supposed (laughs) to be. (laughs) Oh, I love that kind of stuff, though, where it's like, Oh, you really, you literally had to be there. <laughs> like, you had to be alive in the right. 20s. Like, right. You had to be there for 30 years before that joke was told. Yeah. To no really shade on him, though, because I feel like that's true for all old comedy. Oh, I just yeah. does sure. not translate. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just watching a movie I used to love, the second Ace Ventura movie. And like <laughs> even, even 10 years past, like the mm. last point I watched it, I was like, oh boy, a lot of this stuff. Just does I, not just, age. Does not age. <laughs> yeah. Now. Uh, his dad's nickname was Doc because of the aforementioned bit where he pretended to be a doctor. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And the biography I read of Rockwell for Race and Nation claims his dad was an egomaniac. Mm. Quote, a nephew recalled that the son went up and down on what he was doing, period. Another could not recall one instance of affection expressed by Doc towards Lincoln. Doc Rockwell lavishly entertained show business friends who journeyed from New York to Southport for a little rest and relaxation. 
So, George's parents divorced when he was young, and so he split his time between showbiz hangouts with his narcissistic dad and languishing with mom and his overbearing racist aunt. One of his cousins described that side of the family as Archie Bunker types. Yeah. Anti-Semitism, racism, anti-Catholicism, and anti-Italian sentiments were all common at home, but racist talk was kept inside the family. Or and his, belongs, his yeah. dad was not anti-Semitic for that fact, because he was in showbiz and stuff, so he right. had a lot of Jewish friends and whatnot. So that, was, that seemed so to be on his, his mom's his side. So this is just his gross aunt. His gross aunt, and probably... And probably his mom, yeah. Probably his mom. Yeah. I mean, I guess literally everyone was racist by modern standards back right. then. But yeah, I mean, I mean, you know what? Props for them to, to keeping it inside the house. Keeping it in the family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although they, they did not because it boiled oh. over <laughs> the, the, most, the most it possibly could have. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I feel like it's leading. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm forgetting where the story's yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I should note that his family expressed nothing but shock and shame at the beliefs Rockwell would peddle as an adult. So okay. for whatever that's worth. Good for uh, him. <laughs> yeah, good way to go, way to go, Doc. <laughs> way, way to go, Doc Rockwell. <laughs> as a teenager, George Lincoln Rockwell worked as a waiter in a tourist hotel on the coast. He angered easily. Ooh, that's a big surprise. <laughs> mm-hmm. And would regularly get revenge on female patrons who he thought had annoyed or slighted him in some way. His favorite method of doing this was rubbing a syrup-soaked rag on doorknobs, pocketbook handles, light switches, and anything the women might touch. What a little imp. What, what a... Incel. What the, like, <laughs> my what God, incel. Like, already, what? Yeah. They all are. It's like, they are. So I mean, he's it so does... resentful of being slighted by random women that he works for. Most he's of a... what what you've said, except for the stuff about the comedy that doesn't translate, is very applicable to to the modern yeah. men that I know. Like, except slight... for these present. I mean. Have you touched a door handle that I've been around lately? I have Because I got a syrup soaked <laughs> rag in my pocket at all times. Yeah, I don't do that anymore after I slighted you that one time. After yeah. you slighted me that one time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, f- to be honest, most of the, what I use the rag for now is in case there's like a pancake emergency. Obviously. Sure, sure. Obviously. Sure. Obviously. Obviously. Just smart. Just smart. Anyway. Just good planning. My favorite jam band, Pancake Emergency. <laughs> 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 when they played at Red Rocks, that oof, was... Oof, <laughs> I love that, their song, The Syrup Sensation. Yeah. <laughs> that one day of that year when they played at Red Rocks. <laughs> Solid jam for, band yeah. humor in this Nazi podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> George Rock... Lincoln Rockwell grew up mean and tall into a lantern-jawed, six-foot-four-inch adult. He had a commanding presence and an almost pathological need to impress or intimidate everyone he met. Mm -hmm. His high school yearbook said this about him. Mm. Quote, Without question, Lincoln is the loudest talker on the campus, <laughs> the originator of more weird theories than anyone else, and the Academy's outstanding artist. We have every assurance of his being successful because of his incomparable personality and originality. Hmm. Originality is important. Originality. That's good. That's good. You can say a lot of things for George Lincoln Rockwell. Most of them terrible, but he was an original thinker. Mm-hmm. I think you'll agree with that by the time we come around to the I end. I have no here. issues with this guy. I like <laughs> so his. Far, I so like good. his originality. You like the cut of this here yeah, jib? Yeah, on, mm-hmm. on board with this guy. Well, let's keep cutting into the jib. Mm. I don't know what a jib is. George went to Brown University, but he did not enjoy it. He was irritated by the progressive ideals of his professors. Mm -hmm. What little political correctness existed in American universities in 1938 was too too much for Rockwell. Oh, (laughs) these PC thugs in the... (laughs) Don't spit directly onto the black people. (laughs) <laughs> you you PC police PC culture in the 30s and 40s. Oh, Get out of here. Get yeah, out of here, George. Yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> According to his biography, he later claimed he never bought the idea of human equality. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not for sale, man. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not like, for it's sale. Not, sorry. <laughs> we just think people are people. It's not, it's not a product. You're not. Mm, mm. No, you're not selling that to George. <laughs> <laughs> to GLR. He got a job at the school paper, and he drew bad political cartoons and wrote worse columns. A lot of his work was killed by his editors before even being published. Do you have any other political cartoons? I mean, it's censorship oh. right there. But I feel like if you just take a, a Ben Garrison cartoon. I would, like, I, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I was like, I want to see like this proto Ben Garrison. I bet that's who he cites as the um, inspiration. <sighs> it's got to be. It's mm-hmm. got to be. Yeah. He will not be the only person. Now, uh, Rockwell's schoolwork was not much better. At one point, he got an assignment to write about the factors that led to criminal and delinquent behavior in young people. Rather than doing research and writing a scholarly article, Rockwell wrote essentially a speculative sci-fi fable about scientists in Africa. That was the title, Scientists in Africa. (laughs) Uh, According to this fable he wrote, 
the scientists were, quote, studying why ants acted like ants. They searched around until they found a lot of anthills, observed them for many years, and finally came up with the discovery that when ant eggs were hatched in tunnels in a certain kind of hill in Africa and grew up among six-legged creatures called ants, they themselves were so affected by the strong environment that they became themselves ants and waved their antenna like ants, scurried around aimlessly like ants, looked like ants, and were ants. He's saying uh, uh, black people are dumb because they don't. They have to study ants to know okay. that they're ants. That's the joke. That's the whole joke. It's a funny joke. I hate it. it. <laughs> it's terrible. No, it's a funny joke. <laughs> the rule of threes is is really on display oh in my this. God, George. This is the is least racist pro- thing we'll be hearing from Rockwell today. <laughs> <laughs> he's like waiting like what's uh, he's talking about culture like what's it where is he going no oh, that's yeah, the it's, whole it's that's just, the whole that's point it. yeah yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Tough. in spite of his clear talent for storytelling rockwell did not excel in college <laughs> 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 he never graduated and he wound up enlisting in the united states navy slightly before we got into world war ii he became a pilot and flew combat missions in guadalcanal as well as like he flew he flew combat missions in both the pacific and the atlantic theaters uh, and he seems to have been a pretty good pilot during the war. Like, he was very active, flew a lot of missions, mm. like, did a lot of dangerous stuff, although that did not stop him from lying about his service later. He would spend the rest of his life claiming that he'd sank two Japanese submarines. This means George Lincoln Rockwell and L. Ron Hubbard both picked the exact same lie to tell about their service oh in World God. War II. Oh, yes. Oh, that's... I don't know what to do with that info. Right. <laughs> like, what does that mean? You, <laughs> just, you just store it away for later. You just store it away you, for it's later. It's a thing that you, you track, and you yep. know. Yep. And amazing. someday the dots will connect. To someday the dots will, There's two of them. I'm waiting yeah. for three. Right. You need yeah. a third one to really take shape. Waiting for but, Donald Trump to talk about uh, the submarines. Yeah, the two he submarines. <laughs> Which one came first? You know, like who said it first? I think it must have been right around the same time because they were right. both starting to be on the public scene in the 50s. So. Yeah, this sort of like general, like, I wonder if that's just like for a few years, it's like a bunch of people were like, oh, yeah, it's sunk up submarines. <laughs> some, 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 there's probably a lot of people that made that claim. Yeah. They yeah. were both in the Navy, and my God, I can't stop thinking about what if at some air base in the middle of World War II, the two of them wound up having a beer at some point. Mm-hmm. I, I was just thinking that. that. I, I like to think that it's true. That's a great one act play. That is write great. it. That yeah, is a yeah, hell of a one yeah. act play. You write it, we make it. I'm playing Elrond. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh shit. We will make that. I think that's a great idea. Okay, to be continued on that. To be continued. Conversation. They're like talking, like getting along and getting to know each other. And in the background, you hear like someone like, "I just take two submarines." <laughs> That's a great idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> it just like watches over them. Like, they don't even realize they're like just absorbing it. Sinks in there. Yeah. Oh God. Okay. okay. Anyway, okay. here's what Rockwell looked like. Here's what Rockwell looked like during the war. Who wants to describe him? Oh, Katie. Just the, the way you, yeah, that. Oh. <laughs> okay. Honestly, he looks a little bit like my cousin David. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. No shade on your cousin David. Um, no I shade was on my cousin Beavis. David. A Beavis? Yes. He look, he oh looks God, a lot he like really Beavis. does with that mustache, <laughs> and he's got that. Um, he's got some impressive brow work going mm-hmm, on, mm-hmm. and a nice furrowed gaze. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Cody, you take a whack. God, um, David. <laughs> I would say he looks like if Farva joined the military, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see like that. he gets a little, little more fit. He like yeah, he gets yeah. very. He's a very serious man yeah. now, but it's totally Farva. Oh, he doesn't. You know, he looks like someone who who wipes syrup on handles. <laughs> yeah, he does look like a man who wipes syrup on handles. Yeah. I hate to say it, but he will get way better looking as the story progresses. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He he he. The mustache. Witchcraft? The mustache was an error. <laughs> no, yeah. the, the mustache was a mistake. <laughs> That's just one mistake. He's like, of all the things I ever did, I'm sorry about the mustache. In general, I'd say mustaches are a mistake. Yeah. Um, mm. Not all. My dad is a mustache. Sorry, Dad. Dad Dad's going to have throwing a lot of shade your family. I, yeah, wow. oh, I was just God. thinking that and I was regretting it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this uh, whole story reminds me of my shitty aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to the Stoll family. After the war, Rockwell decided to try his hand at art with the dream of working in advertising. Mm. He was accepted by the Pratt School of Design in New York City. Mm. In 1948, his second year, Rockwell won a $1,000 first prize in a national illustration contest. Mm. His winning piece was an anti-smoking ad for the American Cancer Society, which is ironic because for the rest of his life, Rockwell was seldom photographed without a corncob pipe in his mouth. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. I like a man with principles. Yeah, (laughs) so do I. I like advertising. (laughs) (laughs) Nah, cigarettes are what's bad for you. Yeah, because a corncob pipe that that's, that fills up your Q zone better than a better than a cigarette. 
Oh, yeah? I've only read medical <laughs> textbooks from the late 1940s. Uh, but according to those, the Q zone is really critical to keep filled with smoke. The Q zone. The Q zone. That's what you got to keep smoke filled. Is it shaped like a Q or is it uh, is that like stand a... for uh, quality air? Quality. Quality exactly. zone. Quality okay. air. Quality no. zone. You fill, fill it with more smoke and that makes the quality of all the air in your body better. Oh. Yeah. That's I makes perfect you. sense. <laughs> anyway, uh, sponsors Philip Morris uh, have been... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would totally sell cigarettes. Would you? Every, everyone knows at this point. Sure. Well, right. If yeah. I if I had that option, I'd be like, yeah, I'll sell these cigarettes, but I get to say, by the way, they're gonna kill you and they're bad. That that would be I'm my be, whole. I'm getting I'm getting paid to say that these are available. You want to die sooner because the world's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Try are you these tired cigarettes. Of yeah, yeah, they will age you quickly. <laughs> And uh, lie to you yeah. for decades about it. <laughs> Not me, baby. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth. I'll sell you honest poison. Smoke now, them, die. Speaking right. of honest poison, uh, George Lincoln Rockwell opened up an advertising agency with two partners in Portland, Maine. This business came to an end when the Korean War started and Rockwell was recall- recalled to active duty. He didn't fight this time, though. Instead, he trained people at the Coronado Air Base and eventually got involved in politics. His chosen candidates were Senator Joseph McCarthy and General Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> yeah. He loved both men for their violent resistance to the spread of communism, with which he agreed fervently. In 1951, deep in this anti-communist obsession, Rockwell decided to read the autobiography of the greatest anti-communist of them all, Adolf Hitler. Mm. He would later claim that reading Mein Kampf was the most powerful moment of his spiritual life. Quote, word after word, Sentence after sentence, stabbed into the darkness like lightning bolts of revelation, tearing and ripping away the cobwebs of more than 30 years of darkness, brilliantly illuminating the heretofore obscure reasons for the world's madness. I hate him so much. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Big Hitler stand here. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To put that in a little bit of context, uh, China had gone communist in 1949, and by 1951, the Russians had officially got the bomb. The Korean War was seen, particularly by conservatives like Rockwell, as a crucial stand against the violent spread of communism over the globe. Rockwell didn't jump straight into being a Nazi. His first political goal was to organize a rally urging Douglas MacArthur to run for president. Uh, MacArthur, by the way, was the guy who got fired by Truman for trying to nuke China. Mm, Cool. Uh, Cool guy. Cool guy. Good, um... Good fire. Good fire. <laughs> also, solid fire. Yeah. yeah. Also, the guy who uh, made, well, he, he's debatable how well he did in the Korean War. Mm. We, we could argue about that a lot. Now, uh, according to Rockwell, he was stopped from renting a hall in San Diego for a MacArthur rally when a local pro MacArthur activist told him that the Jews hated MacArthur and would not let such a rally happen. Mm. Hmm. Okay. What did. He'd do about that. Yeah. <laughs> he did, did not develop positive feelings towards what, Jewish American what, citizens. What's, what's this uh, Mein Kampf fan going to do about it? <laughs> yeah. That's what we're, yeah. After some time in Coronado, Rockwell was sent back to Rhode Island on Navy business. His wife picked him up at the airport and, according to Rockwell, told him that in his absence she'd learned to be, quote, independent and no longer wanted to sleep with him. We have no way of knowing if this is how the conversation actually went down, of course. Of course it didn't go down that way. <laughs> yeah. no, th- I, I know it did not go down that way. Rockwell Rockwell would later use this story to claim that his first wife, Judy, had been inflicted by what he called the common insanity of modern education, which made women feel their lives were lacking if they became homemakers rather than sought out careers. Rockwell claims he realized his wife had basically been ruined by modernity and that the marriage was over. Mm -hmm. This is... Great. <laughs> like everything you're saying, like, yep, yep, that adds up. Yeah, yep. I've, I've seen, I, I know those people. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I know, oh. I know prominent figures oh. who, 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 who would relate to this story. guy. Yeah, this is, this is the guy who invented a lot of that. Unfortunate, her name was Judy. What? I feel like, you feel like maybe that, like, pushed him over the edge? You're not a fan of the name Judy? It's just like, it rhymes with my aunt's Sounds name like, is Judy. My just, mom's name is Judy. <laughs> I, I mean, if you're if you're like a guy who like is suddenly very resentful of Jews, and then your oh, wife, oh, and your wife oh, is like, oh my god, Whew. yeah, you needed to stop that. Out. Like, By the way, that name sucks. I was like, really coming down. Katie hard and I on. are on, on team the name Judy. Nah, the name Judy's fine. <laughs> if you're not this guy, <laughs> yeah. If you're not, no, that makes sense though. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I okay. could see how he might have some issues with that. I, I withdraw my connection. <laughs> 
Now, thankfully, Rockwell was immediately sent to Iceland next, and during a party in Reykjavik, he met Margaret Thora Halgrimson, a 23-year-old niece of the Icelandic ambassador. He started flirting with her, and they eventually struck up a relationship. Mm. In 1953, he asked his wife formally for a divorce, and she was happy to agree to that. Mm. He married Halgrimson soon after. After his second stint with the Navy was done, Rockwell returned to the United States, Halgrimson in tow. They moved to D.C., where he put together a magazine for the wives of U.S. servicemen called U.S. Lady. It was not a success. <laughs> Rockwell became convinced, however, that it was his mission to create a popular new conservative newspaper that could galvanize what he called the splintered and squabbling right wing into an effective political movement again. You might say his goal was to unite the right. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he pitched his idea to the American Federation of Conservative Organizations, giving it the title The Conservative Times. Tragically, he was unable to find investors for this surely fantastic idea. Eventually, Rockwell met a guy named Harold Aerosmith, the scion of a wealthy family who had become obsessed with poring over the Library of Congress's microfilms to find evidence of a Jewish communist conspiracy to overthrow oh, the nation. Yeah. Oh, yes. Since no actual scholarly publications were willing to publish his findings, mm -hmm. Aerosmith went to Rockwell and basically said, if you help me get my theories out there, I'll pay to print the shitload of propaganda. Yeah. Yeah. So. And that's okay. uh, hyper familiar, too. Yeah. <laughs> Just so everybody's like... <laughs> If you print my batshit stuff, I'll pay you money. <laughs> it gets bat shittier. Uh, but before we cover what happens next on the amazing journey of George Lincoln Rockwell, as... As... speaking of which, Katie, can we do a free plug for your water bottle? Because sure. I am I am loving the look of that water bottle. What, um, what is that? It's called a. It's like a SL, SLM. I'm assuming that's for Slim. It's got like a nice. little wood grain. Nice. My favorite part is that it has a little straw that pops up. It has a little straw that pops mm -hmm. up. If you want a bottle that looks like it's made of wood, buy you a they've, Slim. They've got lots of different colors. It's lovely. And if you want another fine product and or service, uh, purchase commerce units in here. We're back. Back in not the USSR because Rockwell was terrified of communism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go again, there. He would, he would not. He would not have liked that song either. No. Mm -hmm. Probably wouldn't like anything they said. <laughs> probably, probably would not have liked most rock and roll. Yeah, probably wouldn't have liked <laughs> no. their manager. Would, uh, yeah, yeah. Have Might have liked, liked of... like Rocky Raccoon or something. Might have liked Rocky Raccoon. Maybe. Would not have liked the Rolling Stone song, Painted Black. No. Uh, no, that would not have been. Or Brown Sugar. Or Brown. <laughs> you do not want to play Brown Sugar to George Lincoln Rockwell. Oddly enough, big fan of Hey Jude. <laughs> that was the um the B side the... for back in the USSR, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Rockwell took a shine to this rich guy, Aerosmith, immediately, calling him the most violent Jew hater he'd ever met, which in Nazi circles was quite a compliment. That is. Mm -hmm. He agreed to work on the project if Aerosmith would provide a home for his new wife and her children. Aerosmith agreed on the grounds that their project must use the name he'd settled on, the National Committee to Free America from Jewish Domination. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> gotta, gotta Rockwell did not like the name, but, <laughs> but agreed to do it for the money. Yeah. On July 27th, 1958, the National Committee officially announced itself to the world with a picket of the White House. Rockwell printed out large placards covered in slogans. Don't fight another war to save the Jews. He was talking about, like, Israel at this point and the wars they were fighting. Nasser, the president of Egypt, has jailed his reds, but Jews lie that he is red. Communism is Jewish. One of the placards just said the slur, kike. Sure. Yep. I mean, if you're going to do a thing that sucks, why not be a piece of shit about it? <laughs> why not be a piece of shit about it if you're going to do a thing that sucks? Rockwell marched with a small number of young racists he'd gathered. Almost no one came to see them. The crowd that did show up was a mix of journalists and ADL photographers. Uh, Anti-Defamation League. The National Committee marched, and then Rockwell took everyone to a local motel to drink beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> motel? <laughs> motel. All right. Yeah, all that right. is specified yeah, in, the, yeah. in the biography. <laughs> to be clear, it was not a hotel. <laughs> it was a motel. There were there were cars within feet of them. Right. <laughs> Everybody had to pay for their own drinks. Oh. Everybody had to pay for their own drinks. The beds had penny slots. Those windows were right next to each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tragically, this would prove to be the high watermark for the National Committee, because Rockwell had actually sort of screwed over his wealthy benefactor, Aerosmith. He'd printed only a few of the leaflets showcasing Aerosmith's research and used most of the committee's resources to print off his own propaganda for a completely different organization called the World Union of Free Enterprise National Socialists, or Woofens. <laughs> That's better. These losers. <laughs> My God. I mean, tragically, he gets better at the branding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woofens. 
All right. It's a process. You have to understand, neo Nazis didn't exist yet. Woofin right. sounds like yeah, right. a cute little pup name. Woofin too. Right, you got little woofins. Look at this little, little dog. You're yeah. right. No, and branding is important. And like, yeah, you're building up. You're unite the right. We're like, uh, we're all together. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. Uh, we're woofins. We're one fam- big family. Yep. Uh, not you, <laughs> not you, not you, and not we're you. We're one big family. <laughs> we're one big. We're one actually much smaller family yeah, than yeah, the yeah, family yeah. other people uh, want want to exist. Mm, mm. On October 12, 1958, a racist named Wallace Allen detonated 50 sticks of dynamite inside the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation Synagogue in Atlanta. Thankfully, he did this in the dead of night and no one was killed. But suspicion almost immediately turned to George Lincoln Rockwell. Because when police searched Allen's home, they found letters between the bomber and Rockwell. One of Rockwell's letters from July mentioned a big blast. Although he claimed this was a reference to a woofens picketing march he had yeah. planned and not any terrorist attack. It's a better motel like, party. Like a, like a blast in like, we're going to have a blast. We're going to have a blast. It's going to be a big blast. It's going to be a big 50 stick of dynamite sized blast. Kind of blast. Yeah. Rockwell was not charged with any crime in the wake of the bombing. But that attack marked the beginning of a national conversation that we're all still having today. (laughs) What do we do with people who inspire terrorism but don't actively urge it in a legally actionable way? Mm. 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 What do we do about that? What do we do? I don't know. Last December, I lectured a room full of uh, aspiring and current federal law enforcement people about this, and nobody seemed to have a real clear answer. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Oh, good. I want to hear more about that at some point. Yeah, happy to happy to talk about that. Now, um, (laughs) the rabbi of the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation Synagogue was a dude named Jacob Rothschild, which is an unfortunate last name to have uh, if you are one of America's earliest white advocates for school integration and civil rights. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a major, major, like, early civil rights advocate, and the members of his synagogue were unusually active in being white people who are like, we we should all be less shitty to black people. Mm. Uh, Good advice. Good advice. Why they also got bombed. Uh, Bad result of good advice. Yeah, that's how it goes. Mm. Thankfully, no one died. Uh, In a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial for the Atlanta Constitution, Ralph McGill called the bombing, quote, the harvest of defiance of courts and the encouragement of citizens to defy law on the part of many Southern politicians. It is not possible to preach lawlessness and restrict it. To be sure, none said go bomb a Jewish temple or a school, but let it be understood that when leadership in high places in any degree fails to support constituted authority, it opens the gates to all those who wish to take the law into their hands. <laughs> y- yup. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, agree. <laughs> Would have been great if people had listened back then, <clears throat> 1958. Why would we listen to what things happened in the past <laughs> what? That, that might be directly related to why, the present? Why would we think about that? Rockwell had been a fringe figure before the bombing. After it, he was completely abandoned by the mainstream American right. Aerosmith abandoned him too, and his naval reserve status was canceled in December. This left Rockwell destitute without even the money to keep the lights on. As 1959 dawned, Woofens only had nine fully initiated members with 12 more waiting to attain full membership status. I bet you guys are wondering what it takes to become a full member of Woofens. I was just thinking you that. Were, mm. You were thinking about that? Mm-hmm. You, get, you too, Cody? Okay. Well, it, there's a ceremony. Oh. There's, there's a ceremony. Uh, it's described in For Race and Nation as, quote, pricking the cheek with a razor blade, dripping a large drop of blood on the border of a swastika flag, and swearing allegiance to the party with the trooper's oath. All these fucking nerds. Get out of here. <laughs> these fucking nerds. <laughs> Go away with this stuff that happens. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read the trooper's oath. Oh, please do. Oh, yeah. I got to. In the presence of the great spirit of the universe, all capitalized, oh, and God. my loyal party comrades, all capitalized, I hereby, all letters capitalized, <laughs> irrevocably <laughs> pledge to Adolf Hitler, also capitalized, mm-hmm. the philosophical leader of the white man's fight for idealistic and scientific world order against the atheistic and materialistic forces of Marxism and racial suicide. I pledge my reverence and respect to the commander of Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Movement. I pledge my faith, my courage, and my willing obedience to my party comrades, Throughout the world, I pledge my absolute loyalty, even unto death, to myself. As a leader of the white man's fight, I pledge a life of clean and manly honor. To the United States of America, I pledge my loyalty and my careful compliance with its constitution and laws until those which are unjust can be legally changed by winning the hearts of the people. To my (laughs) ignorant fellow white man who will hate and persecute me because they have been so cruelly brainwashed, I pledge my patience and my love. To the traitors of my race and nation, I pledge swift and ruthless justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. That is a cool oath for a great <laughs> a bunch of really, cool, really cool, cool guys. guys. Cool kids. Um, it's almost like what, even if you take out the race stuff, it's yeah. like what unites the right is they all fear the same things and mm-hmm. they all they all like really, really want the same kind of thing. 
It's almost like it is really it's similar. Like Getting really into some similar. ASMR here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what history does to me. <laughs> it's just really frustrating. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Troopers were given code names, which had to be related to their real names, but also make them sound like total badasses. Mm, yeah. So a recruit named Burchard became Trooper Oak. Because Birchard sounded sort of like Birch, but George Lincoln Rockwell didn't think Birch was a badass enough tree. Oh my God, this oak. is so good. All about the oak. <laughs> also, it's, it's like that George W. Bush thing where it's like he sees you eating a burger, so he calls you burger. And yeah. it's like, all right, it's, you know, you're, the glass Or is I don't know, good. Tim Apple. Yeah. Right. Tim, 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 Apple. <laughs> Tim Apple. You know what? I, I'm not going to go on. That, that's, that's funny. It's it is beautiful. funny. It's beautiful. It, it, if I was the president, that's how I would refer to every business leader. Well, it's super it's super hilarious and, and cool and great if he did it on purpose yeah but it's just his broken yeah. brain yeah i would call jeff bezos jeff o packages jeff o- <laughs> <laughs> that would be you know uh, uh jeff bookstore over here yeah, jeffy books <laughs> <laughs> jeff books oh god it would be great if he called like mattis jim jim marines <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah david army over here <laughs> these are great names uh great names uh, also, it's crazy that we actually had a guy in that job whose literal name was almost David Army. Oh, my God. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was so even close. sillier. So close. Yeah. Yeah. It would have worked out so well for him. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Wolfens carried out several picketing actions, which were basically protests in public areas where Rockwell and his stormtroopers would carry incredibly racist signs attacking the Jews or black people. They also sure. published anti-Semitic pamphlets and books with titles like Battle Call, Fight on Your Feet with the World Union of Free Enterprise Socialists, or Live on Your Knees with the Jews. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> not great at titles. Uh, I mean, Battle Call's a fine title, but that's subtitle. Not click. Yeah, well, whenever, <laughs> all these stories, whenever you tell stories like this, and then there's like a title that has like the word Jews in it, there's always like implied, like you put a little stank on it. Yeah. <laughs> and like it's always there. You can always feel it. You can even even just reading it, just the way the rest of the sentence right, is constructed. Right, right. It's just like how they, how, they, yeah. how they wrote it. Like, oh man, I know how you're, I know how you're hearing this word when yeah. you write it. Yeah, 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 exactly. I know how you're saying it in your head mm-hmm. as you typed it. Now, it's important to note that Wolfens was not yet a totally Nazi party, at least not explicitly. You know, Didn't that they oath, say that, that oath was a private oath for okay. troopers? Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. just mean like they weren't like, by the way, we're Nazis. We're not, just not, like, yeah, super out in public. Yeah. We're far. swirling around it. We're we're swir- I mean, they were calling we're... themselves national socialists, but they were up to that point avoiding being super explicit sure. about the Nazi well, thing. I mean, nationalism and socialism, those are two things those you put great them together. Like, what are you, you going to do? And Rockwell did not consider himself a fascist. He said he wanted an authoritarian republic, which is totally different mm. from fascism. Fascism. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that many fascists that want to call themselves fascists. Yeah, he just sort of think about fascists. Yeah. <laughs> he said fascism got in the way of free enterprise. Um, mm. Now, while Hitler had been a racial nationalist, Rockwell sought to spread what he called international racism. He believed that millions of Americans and Europeans were, quote, only a synapse away from discovering that they were national socialists and never knew it because they have never been allowed to know what national socialism is. Mm. Okay, maybe he, I will. Yeah, he, he felt that most conservatives were really national socialists. They were just scared of the word itself because of all the bad press the original Nazis had received for <laughs> some press. inexplicable oh, yeah. reason. All the bad press. All the bad press. They got well, a bit of a know. bad rap. The bit media, bit the media press. loves to stir up controversy. <laughs> they the just, liberal they media. Just can't, just can't stop attacking us for a couple of more than 10 million dead in death camps. A couple of more than 10 million, 20 million killed on the Russian front. Mm. It's just, you know, it's overblown. It's just this bias in the media. You kill 30 or 40 or 50 million people. And, and then the you get a bunch of media. All of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Rockwell knew that his first step towards making national socialism palatable to the general public was to convince them that the Holocaust wasn't real. This was revolutionary mm-hmm. at the time. There was no such thing as organized Holocaust denial in 1959. It did not exist. Tens of thousands of Americans had seen the death camps for themselves mm-hmm. in person. Everyone had watched the newsreel footage from camps liberated by the American army. I, that was like one of the things Eisenhower had done as soon as we found right. it. was like, oh, everybody's seeing this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this has, like the world has yeah, to this see real this Yeah, this real thing. Yeah. yeah, so that people don't do what Rockwell's about to do. Right, like 1959. Like, 1959. It's like, that's like, yeah. There are 30-year-old old Holocaust survivors. Right. Yes. Like, that's like, so recent are, to start, like, what like if... Uh... 16-year-old Holocaust survivors. Yeah. yeah. God. Yeah. So, in order to accomplish his goals, George Lincoln Rockwell had to invent the idea of Holocaust denial. Here's how For Race and Nation describes oh, that process. George. 
Quote, <laughs> to establish a Holocaust was a hoax theme, Rockwell fabricated a story for a CD men's pulp magazine called Sir, with an exclamation point. Yeah! <laughs> the story, quote, by a former corporal in the SS as told to Master Sergeant Lou Kor, which is Rockwell spelled backwards phonetically, oh oh, related smart. how the Nazis conducted vivisection on Jewish concentration camp inmates. The article was accepted and Rockwell received $75 in payment. <laughs> when it was published, the editors used concentration camp photos alongside his story to enhance its appeal. To Rockwell's way of thinking, since the publisher had used bogus photos for a bogus story, the Holocaust must be a Jewish fabrication. Rockwell was to use the magazine article as proof of a Holocaust hoax for the rest of his life. What? Okay. Yeah, there's what do you, what do you say to that? He invented <laughs> he invented Holocaust and I. By like pretending Mm-hmm. To like fake a By thing. By writing a fake story so about fake... real stuff. The Nazis cut up Jewish prisoners in the Holocaust. Right. Some of the doctors who did it admitted it later. <laughs> like, he but just wrote a fake article about it. a fake it. article yeah. that could be like debunked to be like, see, they're lying about yeah. the thing that is actually, oh my God. What? Yeah. And he got paid 75 bucks and for that. And he got that. paid 75 bucks. Wow. What a. You could argue that modern Holocaust deniers, I mean, they're bad people, but maybe they're just. Maybe they really believe stupid. what they what they're saying. But this is somebody yeah. that what's so evil about it is yeah. he knows that he he's... fought in World War Two. Yeah, right. <laughs> like like doing that in the f- late fifties because then yeah you have people now who are like oh it's been like sixty to... years later mm-hmm. after this uh, conspiracy theory even started so it makes sense that you can fall yeah. down that rabbit hole and like get convinced. You cause... could talk to 25 year olds with numbers on their arms. Right. Yeah. At this point. But uh, yeah. man, what a bad person. I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm starting to change my mind about this George guy. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> on board for the first six pages, mm, but then. Mm, yeah, this, this is too much. <laughs> this would be the first great innovation in Rockwell's life as the most influential racist in American history, but it was not enough to save the terribly named Woofens. Without the backing <laughs> of their millionaire patron and without any kind of mass popularity whatsoever, Rockwell's dream of a National Socialist Party quickly fizzled out. By June of 1959, he had only three troopers left, and the lease was up on their headquarters. Rockwell left the United States for Iceland, where his wife and kids had fled, because it turns out they didn't like being with the guy who was trying to revitalize National <laughs> Socialism less than 20 mm. years after Hitler's death. This is his second wife? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When he arrived in Reykjavik, his wife wanted nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. The police escorted him from her home. He got shithouse wasted and cried for a while, and then he decided that he must use the pain of his emotional loss to galvanize him into being an even greater fighter for the cause of white people, who, let me tell you, were really hurting in 1959. (laughs) He would later say that his wife leaving him had given him a, quote, priceless armor of fearlessness. Mm. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. What doesn't kill us makes us Nazis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes. George Lincoln Rockwell returned to the United States with his new armor of fearlessness and began making the changes he believed would be necessary to cause national socialism to catch fire in the American heartland. The first step, he decided, was to stop calling it National Socialism. You might expect that this would be his first move towards embracing a more moderate label for his organization, but Rockwell actually went the opposite direction and started calling himself a Nazi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Counterintuitive. in the oven. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. All right. His strategic considerations were based entirely around what would gain him the most public renown. Mm -hmm. A bunch of men wearing swastikas, calling themselves Nazis, and goose-stepping around at demonstrations would gain more notoriety than a few weirdos ranting about National socialism. In making this call, Rockwell was consciously pulling inspiration from a passage in Mein Kampf. Quote, from Hitler. Whether they laugh or swear at us, whether they present us as fools or as criminals, the main thing is that they mention us, that they occupy themselves with us again and again, and that gradually, in the eyes of the workers, we appear actually as that power with which alone one has to reckon at the time. Yep. There it is. There it is. There's that... Oh, there's yet another just piece of the <laughs> frustrating puzzle in which we all live. In which we all live. Uh, so, like, uh, bad attention is good attention. And, uh, I know. Attention is currency. Mm-hmm. Maybe attention, attention is, is currency. currency. And, he yeah. would have loved Twitter. Maybe that's... George Lincoln Rockwell would have dominated Yes, Twitter. he would have. Yeah. He would have yeah. uh, probably eventually gotten banned and then uh, used that to sort of uh, oh, yeah. push forth. He would have then uh, screenshot his name trending mm-hmm. and then posted it on Instagram. No, I'm trending. I, I feel, and that's good no matter what. I, I, I got to say, like, I get the joke, but I think he's smarter than that. I think he, knowing he the line, he would have well. written it. I think he would have oh. used it way better. I don't yeah. think he would have been like, fuck. I don't think, I think he would have done in this day a thousand times better than Richard Spencer or Jacob right. Roll or any of right, the failed right. Oh, yeah. Riffers. I mean, I mean, they're like, they're like uh, dopes that yeah. have stumbled into what they are. This guy is like... A, he's a genius. Right. He's, he's a yeah. terrible he's, genius. Yeah, he's but, an intelligent yeah. man. He's just fucking stupid. He's just bad. a monster. <laughs> right. yeah. 
But in October 1959, George Lincoln Rockwell officially formed the American Nazi Party. With this action, he gave birth to the concept of neo-Nazism. So, invented mm. Holocaust denial and neo-Nazism within a year of each other. Mm. Heidi Barak, who tracks hate groups for the Southern Poverty Law Center, said this in an interview with the WAMU radio. Quote, he was the first person after World War II when the knowledge of the Holocaust became known and the horrors that had happened under Hitler's regime to take an overtly pro-Hitler position. Really, he's responsible for creating neo-Nazism in the United States. It's entirely possible that without Rockwell, Nazism would be dead as a political concept, at least in the United States. That is debatable. What isn't debatable is the foundational role Rockwell played in the concepts behind racist organizing in this country and worldwide. On Christmas Day, 1959, a synagogue in Cologne, Germany, was defaced with swastikas and anti-Semitic graffiti. This sparked a rash of attacks on synagogues across Europe. Rockwell joyfully took credit for inspiring the violence. He added, quote, I deplore the avenues some of them have chose. I would not permit my troopers to paint swastikas on synagogues or churches. It's not necessary here. It is in Europe, where there's no other way. <clears throat> you know what this is a terrible time for? I could act. An ad pivot. <laughs> 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 but we're pivoting! Pivoting! And Spend your money. We're back! Thank God. Thank God. You guys, I, I could tell you were like shaking from Rockwell withdrawals. Yeah, I was. I felt lost during that ad break. I, I know, I know. That's what Nazism does. <laughs> <laughs> during the 1960 election, George Lincoln Rockwell caused controversy by publicly endorsing Richard Nixon. This move would be echoed decades later by the decisions of former KKK leader David Duke and racist asshole Richard Spencer to endorse Donald Trump in the 2016 election. Uh. To his credit, Nixon immediately told ABC, I completely repudiate him and all the evil he represents. Thank you, Good job, Nixon. Thanks, 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 thank you, Nixon. Thanks, Nixon. Thanks, Nixon, for not waffling on whether or not to disavow a literal Nazi. Yeah, yeah. Also, thanks for uh, the EPA. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I, credit opening up trade doing... with China. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Nixon, not... good guy. <laughs> Nixon. Not thank you for extending the Vietnam War. That was tens of thousands of additional deaths, but mm-hmm. it wasn't wasn't a zero something. Also, all that racist <laughs> stuff. Also, all that said. racist stuff. At least he, yeah. Mm. <laughs> real well. Let's stop talking about Nixon. <laughs> we'll we'll do the nine parter on Nixon. Right. Right. Yeah. Another day. Rockwell was not just a blind ideological hate monger. He was a serious racist thinker with serious racist goals and a fairly logical way of looking at the world. He developed a set of four phases that he believed were necessary for his party and its racist ideas to gain power in America. These rules were based not just on what Hitler had done, but on the strategies successfully employed by communist political movements in the East. Phase one, become known. This includes getting in the headlines, rallies, and promotional material. Phase two, develop leadership cadres, teaching about white rights, the anti-white movement, miscegenation, and party tactics. Phase three, mass recruitment. This includes public relations, toning down the party in order to become more mainstream, recasting the party as legitimate, instigating tensions that increase party membership, i.e. racial riots. And phase four, taking of power, mass action. A crisis situation leads to rapid expansion. Paramilitary substrata of the movement begins to take control by force and using direct confrontations with the government and the security apparatus of the state. I assume you saw those uh, chat logs from... uh... Mm-hmm. Identity, identity, Europa. identity Europa. Identity Europa, I- a direct the, uh, descendant of the American Nazi Party, uh-huh. as are literally all of the fascist groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Actively yeah. trying to infiltrate mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Uh, Republican Party and, and influence it. Yeah. yeah, he is the founding father of American, like, yeah. A- active fascism. Not sure if you're yeah. going to get to that or not, but yeah. oh, I was like, oh, it yeah. fl- oh, flashed the, in my brain the, a little bit. The third episode is just about what he inspired. I cannot wait. Oh, it's going to be horrible. I hate it. I'm <laughs> <it's> bad. <laughs> <laughs> Rockwell was, above all else, a creative political thinker. On June 25th, 1961, he took nine members of his new revitalized American Nazi party to a Nation of Islam rally in Washington, D.C. The Nazis mm-hmm. marched right into the Ulin Arena, outnumbered 800 to 1, and took their place among the otherwise almost entirely black audience. They were not there to pray protest, but to show support. The Nation of Islam's leader, Elijah Muhammad, and his right-hand man, Malcolm X, were at the time black separatists. Malcolm X's speech that night was literally titled, Separation or Death. Despite repeated shocking statements of racism, Rockwell also regularly expressed admiration for Malcolm X. He backed the Nation of Islam because he saw them as having the same essential goal as the ANP, racial separation of black and white people. Mm -hmm. At one point during his speech, Malcolm X admonished the white members of the audience, telling them they should really donate to the Nation of Islam if they support at its cause. Rockwell was among the first to whip out a $20 bill and hand it over. Life photographer Eve Arnold, who was there to shoot the event, took a picture of this. She was Jewish, and when Rockwell saw her photographing him, he yelled, 
I'll make a bar of soap out of you. She replied, as long as it isn't a lampshade. <laughs> Solid rejoinder. What a girl! Uh, okay. What a girl! All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, okay, 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 yeah. That's okay, a good. That's okay, a good okay. comeback. Right. Yeah. I just locked eyes with all the women in the room, and we were all like nodding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Nation of Islam event was great PR for Rockwell. Esquire magazine attacked him and his ideas, but couldn't avoid describing him in weirdly positive tones. How much taller he is than Hitler, and how much better looking, <laughs> <laughs> and how much better looking. To be fair, they weren't wrong. By this point, he'd shaved his mustache, and he looked a lot. I Let's mean, see. look at that. He's the guy in the middle, and uh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, it's he's an improvement. Handsome. Yeah. Um, who does he look like to me? He's got some cheekbones going. A little bit Cary Grant in there. A little bit Cary Grant. A little bit Cary Grant. He is much taller than Hitler. <laughs> oh. I mean, this isn't a side by side between him and Hitler, but you can just and you tell. can tell. Um, I mean, yeah. This the he looks like a leading man. Or, kinda ruins the uh, actually, Godzilla he doesn't look lore. like a leading man. He looks like the villain, but like the handsome. Yeah, you're right. He like looks the like the Nazi. The, he looks like, he looks like the Nazi. Like, but he's like <laughs> kind of in the way that you're like Billy Zane. Yeah. Uh, uh, part of you was like, go with Billy Zane. You know, he's got a he's hell handsome. of a jawline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Cody. Yes. I'm really excited. To yes, Robert. Next yes. The American Nazi Party was chronically low on funds the entire time Rockwell ran it. His fundraising strategy then relied entirely on ginning up controversy in his public appearances and using that to solicit donations. Mm. He had a variety of ways of accomplishing this, but his most reliable tactic was getting invited to speak at colleges. Oh, interesting. Oh. Oh, interesting. There would inevitably be protests and often fight him, which would lead to publicity that would convince hidden neo-Nazis to mail him checks. Oh, interesting. <laughs> the, well, those protesters seem like they're real Nazis, though. Those protesters because they're trying to shut down free mm-hmm. speech. Yeah, 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 yeah. In San Diego, the Committee for Student Action invited Rockwell to speak at the State College. He gave a speech to a group of 3,000 students, introducing himself by saying, if I had wanted trouble, I could have worn my uniform with my Nazi armbands and the whole works. Believe me, I know how to stir people up if I want to. Mm. Mm. Rockwell then railed against homosexuality in California. He uh-huh. talked about seeing men holding hands in the streets of Hollywood and told the students, if there's one thing I'd rather gas than communists, it's queers. Uh. <laughs> At one point, 22-year-old Ed Cherry, a Jewish student and hero, took the stage and demanded Rockwell hand him the microphone. When Rockwell refused, Cherry punched him in the face repeatedly and yeah. broke his sunglasses. Oh, the rest those of the sp- Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Punch a Nazi. The rest of the speech was canceled. Next, Rockwell and his men were scheduled to give a talk to journalists at the school newspaper. During the rock f- walk from the auditorium to the paper's offices, they were surrounded by students and pelted with eggs. Here's how For Race and Nation described what he said when he finally talked to the baby journalists. Rockwell told the journalism students that there was a conspiracy to discourage his speaking invitations. The attack by Cherry was part of a plan to keep other colleges from inviting him. He put the attack in perspective, calling it a minor skirmish. Such violence hurt his cause in the short run, but helped it in the long run, because people finally realize what is happening that's ruining this country. It's terrorism. In other words, there is no free speech. For a man who preaches what I do, they try to kill you. I'm so mad. (laughs) Rockwell would speak at dozens of colleges over the course of his career. We'll talk about this more in part two, but I can't overstate how critical they were for the ANP's financial independence and how he literally invented the blueprint that every right-wing grifter uses today. Yeah, mm-hmm. we just keep coming back to yeah. that. I'll just go I'll speak at a college. People will yell and People throw stuff at me, and then I'll and, get more money. And then I'll be the guy who mm-hmm. got shouted out at the, mm-hmm. the, the school for By speaking those the truth. violent leftists. Yeah, the violent leftist mm-hmm. uh, Nazis, because mm-hmm. um, that's the, the real that's the real situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, did he debate uh, kids? And how. Oh, yeah, he did. <laughs> Love debating. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> Nazis are good. Change my mind. <laughs> God. <laughs> the hundreds of dollars brought in by the honorariums paid by colleges literally kept Rockwell's lights on. Soon there were A&P HQ buildings in Virginia, California, and Texas. The actual number of stormtroopers was rarely higher than, you know, a few dozen to maybe like a hundred or two at the most. But the presence of these buildings gave Rockwell's movement street cred and also provided an opportunity for him to make the news and thus solicit more donations. A&P headquarters buildings were bedecked with signs that said stuff like, White man fight! Smash the black revolution now! <laughs> the black revolution to... Go to the same schools as everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Use the same water. For- Revolution. Revolutionary idea <laughs> yeah. there. Those of you who know me and my relationship with law enforcement know that I am not exactly a big fan of the FBI. To be honest, I have not forgiven them for the Anarchist Exclusion Act of 1918. Mm. But I am, above all else, a fair man. And for all of his many, 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 many flaws. J. Edgar Hoover was not on the wrong side (laughs) of this particular issue. The Bureau instantly recognized Rockwell as a threat. 
His mm-hmm. file described him as, quote, a professional bigot, a con man, a malcontent, and a chronic failure who will stop at nothing to gain notoriety and even power. He is a man whose tongue and pen are jagged weapons of slow destruction, a shrewd, small mind inflated into a national nuisance by undeserved publicity. He is a braggart and a bully who tries to delude his maladjusted followers into believing they are crusaders. Well said. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> just like, yeah, pretty good writing for the yeah. FBI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They did not, however, write him off as a harmless crank, because the FBI knew something about Nazis that I really wish the modern FBI would catch on to. Mm. Quote, Though small in numbers and influence, the ANP is a dangerous organization of misfits who are psychologically and physically capable of perpetrating acts of violence. If this organization is ever in a position to do so, these American Nazis, like the Nazis of Hitler's Germany, will follow through with their obnoxious objectives of liquidating all whom they consider inferior. It is well to remember that in his early days, Adolf Hitler, like Rockwell, was ridiculed and scorned. We would do well to heed the American Nazi party and to remember that history is replete with incidents where a nucleus of an organization and the right conditions merged to shake the foundations of the world. What is a stronger word than obnoxious? Oh my but, God, yeah. that's like good, good <laughs> yeah, job. Good job, the FBI being aware yeah. of history and how mm-hmm. things happen. Being, being aware of twenty years ago, right? <laughs> right. Wow, that's um. I really wish any uh, figure. Uh, with any, 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 with, with some power. any any amount of power would say something like that. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, it would be. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but they could instead they could like target. They could yell at people for yelling at people for speaking at college campuses. Yeah, and then mm-hmm. target like left wing activists, mm-hmm. and then, mm-hmm. and ignore that like all their organizations in the military are being sort of infiltrated by white supremacists. Why would that be important, Cody? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> why would, I'm just, why would I'm just, you care about I'm that? I'm just saying stuff out loud. It doesn't matter. It, it <laughs> is not like there are any incidences where, say, a, a military combat veteran built a 6,000-pound bomb and destroyed a federal building and killed 168 people. If something like that had happened, I'd Different say story. you should be worried. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll keep my eyes open for something like that. But <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to go take a couple of naps. <laughs> yeah, <it's> perfect. <laughs> just like our national security. Security apparatus. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Ooh, well done. Yeah. The FBI report on Rockwell included summaries of the ANP's major publications. Quote, the Rockwell Report, which appears monthly or every two months, is a pseudo-newspaper in which Rockwell comments on and makes predictions regarding national and international occurrences, lashes out at hecklers and enemies, and discusses A&P business. The Stormtrooper, a bi-monthly magazine, contains articles regarding aspects of national and international Nazism and features articles containing scurrilous squibs about Jews and Negroes. Scurrilous squibs. Yes. Yeah. really like the writing I mean, shops of the old time FBI. Yeah. The, yes, they're the alliteration. Trying. Yeah, the, yeah, like it's much more colorful. They're, it's good. It's yeah, good yeah, stuff. Yeah, they're trying to go for also, like a little bit of poetry. He a little, definitely a little would have had a podcast. Oh my god. Oh yeah. I mean, he'd be, so would Hitler. So yeah. would Hitler. Yeah. 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 I mean, it wouldn't even be a podcast. It'd be just like he'd have a radio show. He'd be yeah. like a daily. Well, I know, but I think it would probably get canceled, and somehow they. would you know, and he, yeah, move he'd, it go, too. he'd go to. I mean, I, I think he'd probably have taken Tucker Carlson's job, to be honest, because he's sure. yeah. way smarter. Yeah, he'd be selling gold and. Yeah, um, oh, so much gold. Brain brain a lot of gold brain and brain pills. pills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it also included. <laughs> uh, sorry. The FBI report also included descriptions of the AMP's pamphlets, which are just about the most hatefully racist things that I can imagine. The 1960s FBI agents writing about them were shocked by the level of racism. Hmm. 1960s. The same group that was urging Martin Luther King Jr. to kill himself were shocked by the racism of the AMP stuff. (laughs) Quote, Leaflets, pamphlets, brochures, throwaways, stickers, and other types of easily disseminated messages are the more common types of A&P propaganda. One repugnant pamphlet disseminated by the party advertises a Brotherhood Inward Talk Dictionary. They did not what? use the phrase inward. Okay. Compiled by the A&P as a public service for parents whose children are attending the integrated schools. There is even a section of this handy Brotherhood Dictionary explaining how to be tactful about interracial love. Inside this pamphlet is a drawing of a familiarization kit whose contents include such odious items as selected rocks carefully balanced and weighted for breaking out school windows, pack of marijuana reefer cigarettes for smoking at interracial orgies, etc., switchblade knife, lightning fast, extra long blade for stabbing students, and Spanish fly, powerful aphrodisiac for slipping into girlfriend's whiskey or wine. Great. Great. All the tools a a, a person needs. You know how with like the KKK stuff, it was racist, but it was so dumb and batty that you could laugh at like the cool coast camp a little bit. Right, right. This is the opposite. There's just nothing. Yeah. It's it's just horrible. So, Cody, I would like you to describe this next pamphlet, which the FBI provided as an example of the A&P's typical humor. 
which they put, and I put in quotation humor. marks. Humor. I love humor. Please don't actually read the slur. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't read that. I will be putting most of this stuff up on the site. I'm not going to put the stuff with slurs on it up on the site. I'll put the things where you can find it, but um, yeah, I don't... Yeah, uh, yeah we yeah. don't need to go too much into this mm-hmm. uh well a i mean it's only words um the very first word is a word i will not say yeah um it's the n word it's the, the n word uh very with an big, exclamation very bold point. With exclamation yeah. point mm-hmm. it's uh, it's getting uh people's attention saying hey hey listen look at this look at this mm-hmm. uh you too can be a jew <laughs> Exclamation point. It, exclamation point. It's easy. Exclamation point. It's fun. Insult the white folks. Make more money. Love the white women. And then there's a picture of a book called How to Be a Jew. And then Yeah. Yeah. And I think then, you've gotten it across. I, yeah. There's a lot wait, of writing on wait, there. Wait, wait, let me finish the joke. Hold on. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to read it. Okay. Ha 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 ha. That's me reacting to is the that, funny is, joke. Is that, is that a full number of haws? That <laughs> that's, <deserved>? that's awful. <laughs> yeah. It's, Do you get that out of my sight. <laughs> I'm going to burn this script after reading. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this can't feel good to type up. No, no, it did not. This uh, That's hideous. Uh, I do think it's necessary for everyone to hear because I want to contrast those publications with how Rockwell presented himself. Well, it's just like memes. It's like the it's memes like you see. It's just you like, see right now. Yeah. I want to contrast those publications that we've just gone through with how Rockwell presented himself when he was in front of cameras and microphones addressing students. Mm. I'm going to play you an excerpt from a speech that Rockwell gave very close to here at UCLA in Mm. 1967. Mm. Sophie? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Raff. And let me first say how grateful I am for this opportunity to speak on the academic community. It's the only opportunity left to me in this country to speak in a way that the American people get to hear and judge me for themselves. In every other forum, every other place I attempt to speak out in the street, the people who loudest claim to love free speech and demand free speech for themselves usually insist on using physical violence to try to stop me from enjoying my free speech. Oh my God, oh my God. And when I try to speak in the the streets, I need troops. The only place where I can speak, I can't even hire a hall. When I hire a hall, they usually threaten the owner. There's bomb threats and so forth. So this is the last refuge of free speech left in the country. And I'm sorry to say it is usually accorded to me by the liberals. And I must confess, I admire their courage and their sincerity in granting this opportunity to me. Brave liberals. Congrats, liberals. Uh, Classic liberals. Classic (laughs) Classic liberals. liberals. Let's be fair. That is classic liberals. Classic liberals right there. Literal Nazi speak at your college. Wow. Um... This clip was from, you say, 19, decades ago? 1967. Oh, interesting. Oh. Half a century mm. in the past. Mm. 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 <laughs> I was wondering why the quality of the, the audio wasn't as If it as wasn't that, I would have thought yeah. we were listening to CPAC Like or last weekend? Yeah. No, yeah. not the liberal part, but. Yeah. No, not the. No. There was, of course, ample racism in Rockwell's lectures and speeches to colleges, but nothing so hateful, crass, and crude as the things in A&P literature. It was a shallow veil, but one that fooled a number of Americans. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. that is all I have to say for today for part one. Okay, okay. When we come back on Thursday, or Wednesday, actually, for part two, we're going to talk about the Jewish community's reaction to the American Nazi Party and the first attempts by activists, you might call them anti-fascists, mm. to respond to Rockwell's <laughs> truly innovative trolling. It's going to be just <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff that seems eerily familiar despite being more than half a century old. Tune in! <laughs> I can't wait. You guys got some pluggables. Well, actually, I, I, wanna, I wanna do a quick thing first. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... As I, I mentioned at the start, this was originally going to be uh, part of like a five-part audiobook on the origins of American right-wing terrorism. Yeah. I'm now doing that audiobook as a totally separate thing because Rockwell wound up being uh, a full thing on right. itself. <laughs> so if you go to GoFundMe and look up The War on Everyone, that's the working title oh, of the good. audiobook. So yeah, good title. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, GoFundMe, The War on Everyone. Uh, if you want to donate some money, you know, that audiobook will come out. And the, mo- the money that I make for it, I will use to you know, further the conflict journalism work, the stuff yeah. that I've got yes. done in in Portland uh, and over in D.C. on the East Coast, like going to, to these rallies. If we get enough, I might even be able to go somewhere like, you know, Royava again or, mm-hmm. or do more of the like foreign conflict reporting. So you're going to definitely get an audiobook and you'll get more stuff too in the future. GoFundMe, The War on Everyone. Now, do you guys want to plug your pluggables? Yeah. Cool. 
check us out online. Got in line. The uh, internet, yeah, we we this, don't have what you just said. No, but we've got... You've uh, got a thing that produces things, stuff every yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, YouTube we channel is uh, Some yeah, More News. If you, uh, yeah, Google Some More News in YouTube. Our, our show, basically weekly, we do stuff there. Um, we also have a podcast called Even More News. We talk about the news. It's all on... You can go to the, the Apple. Google to the, the things. You know, wherever you want to go. You yeah, uh, I would say our Patreon.com slash Some More News. That's where like uh, our patrons go mm-hmm. um, to support us and make bonus sure... Content, yeah, we do bonus stuff. content and also like... Makes more episodes. Um, we try to give as much as we can, but it, you, you, you know, guys give a lot and produce a ton of really good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it takes a lot. So some of the best news that you can get at this moment in this our moment, American yeah. history with jokes. I do have a question. Yeah, would you ever let, say, the commander of the American Nazi Party speak on your podcast? Because I thought you loved free speech. I and if you don't let Nazis have a platform, speech. you don't love free speech. I'd have to do a pre-interview, I think. I would. Uh, yeah, with my fists. With my fists. I would do that. I would probably do something like this, maybe, where yeah. I sort of talk about that person yeah. and delve into their ideology mm-hmm. and sort of uh, represent their, them accurately. But yeah. this already exists. Um, but it seems like it already exists. You've done a bunch of that. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, some more news. Patreon, mm-hmm. the YouTube yeah, podcast. We're on, we're on Twitter. Dr. Mr. Twitter. Cody is my Twitter Dr. handle. Dr. Mr. Cody. Katie Stoll. Yeah. Katie Stoll. I'm I Write OK on Twitter, where you can find me yelling about Nazis mm. even more, if that's <laughs> something you like. <laughs> that's what you're into. You can find us on the internet, this podcast, at, at Bastards Pod. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, mm-hmm. a.k.a. The Gram, uh, by the same name. Mm-hmm. You can buy a T-shirt, a cup, a sticker. Uh, literal horse and buggy, uh, all branded with wow. our uh, our special content. Uh, behind the bastards, tpublic.com and behind the bastards.com is our website. Uh, uh, tomorrow we're back.